go. Okay, so as the presentation title says, this is going to be the non-idiot's guide to AIS. So I'm, I'm going to hopefully take you, um, I'll introduce you to obviously AIS in general, but we'll also dig down a little bit deeper than probably you would uh, normally go in, in presentations. Um, I'm not going to spend, I mean, I've, I've listened into webinars before and they can be awfully boring things. So what I'm going to do is obviously go through the, uh, the slide deck, but um, we won't dig into all the details because I'm going to, um, as soon as this uh, webinar is finished, I will uh, put the actual presentation itself up on our blog. Um, so you just need to go to digitalyacht.net to, to download the actual slides themselves. So let's uh, let's get cracking. Okay, so what is AIS? Um, well, I'm sure uh, you'll all have uh, know AIS and probably have fitted AIS systems yourself or use them. So again, I won't spend too much time going into this, but AIS was developed around um, uh, around the uh, end of the uh, 20th century, uh, around 2000, um, and it was using uh, GPS technology and VHF technology to transmit your digital position to other vessels. Um, and uh, it uses uh, also a lot of digital signal processing technology in there um, to actually uh, transmit that that data. And it was, after initial testing, it, was, it, was, it proved really successful. Uh, it was made mandatory on uh, large vessels over 300 tons or carried more than 12 passengers. And because of the success in the big commercial vessels, um, it sort of, they, they uh, started to, to look at other types of vessels that could use AIS, and we'll be discussing those. So there's actually different classes of AIS. Um, in the uh, pleasure boat world, uh, we've got the, um, on, on, it first started off, some of you may have seen uh, units like the NASA AIS uh, receiver was one of the first AIS receivers for pleasure boats. And um, so you can have, a little black box called an AIS receiver, which would just receive and display the um, positions of other vessels. And then you can also have on larger vessels, uh, class A transponders, um, which transmit their the vessel's position plus other information about the, the vessel, its voyage and static data. And then you have uh, for the pleasure boat market for vessels that don't have to have an AIS transponder, but choose to uh, have one, the benefits it provides then you've got class b and b plus transponders and we'll go into the more details the differences between the different types uh, later in the presentation so a little bit about the history as i said uh, it was it all was um, first conceived actually in the early 1990s uh, there's various committees and uh, projects uh, to to look at how it could be implemented um, and then Around 2000, they started doing tests, uh, primarily in Sweden. Um, was, and at that time, it was just called the Universal AIS system. There was no different classes at all. Um, and as I said, it, the, the initial uh, rollout was very successful. And then we had the Class B defined for pleasure boat vessels. That came out around about 2003. And you can see the timeline on the bottom here. And now you've got things like search and rescue transponders, You've got special uh, inland transponders now for European waterways. Um, you've got satellites um, uh, up in, in low orbit that can receive the AIS signals and feed those back to a base station. So there's lots of development over the last 20 years. And it's really changed the, the way in which AIS is, is being used from those first initial uh, tests. So. How does it work? So technically, um, it uses uh, time domain, um, uh, the same sort of technology as used in mobile phones to allow lots of different devices all to share the same um, airwaves and to transmit their messages without uh, collisions and, and, and problems. Um, so basically, if you imagine that in any given minute, there's 4,500 time slots in which a vessel can transmit its position and some vessels will take more than one time slot in that period uh, whereas other vessels will just take one or two 
Um, so the way that uh, Class A systems uh, do that is they actually um, tell all the other Class A vessels that are the time slot that they want, and once they preserve that, they also then forward um, order, if you like, the next time slot. So that all the Class A vessels are organised. They use this called self-organised SOTDMA, um, which ensures that they always get a time slot and they always get priority. And the Class B system works within that same system, the same time slots, but it's basically a Class B unit will listen for what all the Class A's are doing, and they'll see that all these Class A's have reserved these time slots, and they'll be listening for, um, or for the carrier signal. And as soon as they detect that there's um, a free time slot available, they try and grab it. Um, sometimes they'll fail, and another device will get it for them, but at some point they will um, grab a time slot and be able to transmit their position. But it's not, so the Class B, it's very much um, subservient to the class A. So if there's time slots available, it will, it will be able to grab them. But if not, if uh, the time slot will be taken by a class A in preference to a class B system. And we'll also talk, um, I've just recently added this class to the to the presentation, the class B plus, which is, a, is the newest uh, class of AIS system. And the class B plus uses the same self-organized time domain uh, system that the Class A units use, so it has an equal priority with the Class A, um, but it's a black box type design like the uh, other Class B units, so Class B plus. Um, but we'll talk about more about the differences between the classes later on. So a little bit more about the technical things. It uses two AIS uses two VHF frequencies primarily. There is the capability within the system. For a uh, for somebody like the U.S. Coast Guard, for instance, to uh, tell all the vessels in the local area to switch frequencies, should there be a problem, or should there be uh, uh, too many targets in a particular frequency. But generally speaking, uh, it was only ever tested once, and it was a bit of a disaster in the Chesapeake Bay area. So, so what the um, so most marine agencies now are very very fit, fearful of actually using this facility where you can change frequency. So generally speaking, there'll always be uh, the transmissions on two frequencies, that's 161 megahertz, 162 megahertz, which is the top end of the VHF range. Um, because it uses VHF transmission signals, it's, it's subject to the same constraints as, as VHF radio. So you know, line of sight, uh, higher the antenna, the, the, the longer the range. Uh, that, all of the, the sort of things that you, you're used to with uh, VHF radio uh, performance is subject to AIS. Now, when AIS was uh, introduced, um, NMEA 183 was um, uh, well defined at that point, but it was only at 4800 boards, so they had to introduce a newer, higher speed board rate for AIS. So they introduced NMEA 0183 high speed, which is 38,400 board. And that causes quite a lot of confusion, uh, even though there's only the two board rates, um, end users do tend to get a little bit confused as to uh, the board rates. And very often I um, talk to, to customers who've got the wrong board rate set up on their chart plotter, and that's why they're not receiving AIS targets. So since so, so when AIS first started, it was only transmitting data over 183. More recently, there's been NMEA 2000 PGNs defined for all the AIS messages. So uh, all the uh, a lot of the modern uh, AIS units have both NMEA 183 and NMEA 2000 interfaces for transmitting the data to other systems. Um, okay, I'll go on. We'll talk a little bit more about the messages later. Um, as I said, uses VHF frequencies. And the different classes of transponders use different power ratings as well. So as you see here, uh, class A is transmitting at 12 and a half watts, about half the power of a normal VHF radio transmission. Um, and the class B plus transponders are transmitting at five watts, uh, class B at two watts, and the new AIS man overboard and SARTs are only actually transmitting at one watt. Uh, we'll talk about those uh, a bit later. And you've got the expected ranges there, and that's in an ideal situation that uh, lots of you know, uh, factors can affect the, the maximum range.
Okay, so we've talked about the uh, types and classes of, of AIS. Let's talk a little bit about the actual data that's transmitted. So you'll hear um, uh, talks about, you'll hear people talk about dynamic data and static data when it comes to AIS. So dynamic data is things like the position of the vessel, uh, is speed and course over the ground, all the things that are changing on a regular basis. Um, and those are the things that are transmitted uh, more often than, uh, so uh, we'll talk about transmission rates in a minute. Um, then you have the static data. So this is the things that don't change very often. So things like the boat's name, uh, its dimensions, uh, those uh, data that don't change are called static data. And they generally are only transmitted every six minutes uh, by all the different systems um, because they're not going to change. As a piece of equipment gets turned on, it needs to know this data. So it has to wait six minutes before it gets all of the static data from all of the AS targets in its, in its range. And then the last type of data is only transmitted by Class A vessels, and this is the voyage data. So this is the data that the um, uh, navigation officer on board the uh, uh, on, on board a large commercial vessel would, at the beginning of the uh, uh, voyage, would enter their destination, their ETA uh, draft, and the number of people on board. And also, they enter the navigational status of the vessel, so if it's underway, if it's manoeuvring, uh, anchor, things like that. But you only ever see that data transmitted by Class A vessels. Okay. So, um, frequency of AIS transmissions. Uh, it does vary between the different classes of vessels, and I won't, we won't go into all of this, but basically Class A uh, transponders transmit more often, almost, and depending upon and also what it's doing if it's if, it, if it's maneuvering if it's changing course um, so this is primarily for things like fast ferries so you don't want a fast ferry that's doing over 20 knots and is turning um, sh sharply to starboard you want to know regularly up, get more uh, frequent updates on that vessel than you would if it was a, a slow moving yacht on a, on a fixed course so Typically, Class A transponder, it's got the GPS input coming in, telling it what speed the, the vessel is doing. And so it changes the transmission rate based on that speed that, that the vessel is doing at that particular time. And Class B+, plus, um, that also works in the same sort of way. It doesn't have quite as many um, sort of s s uh, situations, but certainly as you start to um, speed up in a, in a vessel with a Class B+, plus, transponder on board, it will change, it will start to update more frequently. Um, and then finally you've got class B, um, which when it's stationary is every three minutes, it just transmits, and then as soon as the speed over ground goes above two knots, it will start to transmit every 30 seconds. And you can see at the bottom there of that table, the static data that we've just spoken about, is the boat name and the dimensions, those for each of the different classes of AIS always transmitted every six minutes. So as I previously said, if you turn a new uh, chart plotter on um, and you want to see all the AS data coming up, you'll see all the AS data start to appear, but it will be six minutes before you get all the static data for those vessels shown. So they'll, they'll show an MMSI number uh, and then after about six minutes when it gets the static data, it will tell you the boat name and its dimensions. That's, that's uh, quite often a, a question that customers and, and end users ask. Okay, so what's communicated? Um, again, it varies between the, the class of, of uh, AIS, but you've got uh, typically all classes of uh, transponders transmit the MMSI, best of the MMSI number of the vessel. Now that's the key bit, because that's the bit that ties the static and the dynamic data together. So. The MMSI number is, is a key element in there. Uh, you've got the vessel name and the call sign. Um, all transponders transmit position, course, and speed over ground. And also, all transponders, both Class B and Class A, uh, are capable of transmitting the true heading. The difference is, is that many Class B systems will not have a big gyro compass on board or a GPS um, uh, satellite GPS system uh, on board, which will give out the necessary true heading. So you very rarely see Class Bs 
actually transmitting the true heading, although there is the capability within the system for that data to be included. But on a Class A vessel where they've got they've got particular systems that they have to connect up to the Class A, you'll get true heading, you'll get rate of turn, you'll get the navigational status that I mentioned. Um, so as long as the uh, the uh, chief officer on, on board has actually changed, remember to change the navigational status because it is a manual uh, operation, then you should see that a vessel is underway, it's uh, maneuvering or anchor or whatever the other navigational status are. You've got for the class A vessels, you've got the IMO number um, and both classes transmit the type of vessel. Um, and so you'll, you should always see the type of vessel. Um, some some systems will colour code the type of vessel, so a super tanker will be shown as a different um, coloured symbol than a, than a yacht. Um, and all systems also transmit the vessel dimensions. But the voyage data is, that's the last um, row there, the ETA, the destination graph, that is unique to Class A. Okay. So the AIS message types. So there are, um, as well as uh, the Class A and Class B um, AIS systems, there's also base stations, which you often find in, uh, in harbours, which are used by harbour authorities uh, to control AIS um, and also used to set up uh, ATONs and, and other types of, of AIS systems. So uh, I just mentioned there also ATONs, to navigation, that's a newer type of AIS transponder. So this is where you put an AIS transponder on a buoy uh, to transmit details about the buoy, maybe weather, tidal information as well. Um, and that's a, a new area of, of AIS where people like Trinity House are now starting to put up um, uh, AIS atons on um, both on buoys themselves, but also there's the capability to have virtual atons where you have a base station, say in Portsmouth and Harbour, if there's suddenly a, a problem at the, uh, outside the harbour, a, a ship's in trouble and it's, and it's sunk and it's going to cause a potential uh, problem for other shipping, then they can actually create what are called virtual atons, where they actually send out these virtual positions of buoys. And so on a chart plotter, you'd actually see a series of virtual um, Aton symbols on the on the on the on the chart plot screen, indicating where the problem is, where this boat may may have gone down, um, and uh, that will be used more and more in the future, I think, to uh, to to uh, as a as a way of of managing vessels and making uh, things safer. Uh, another example is in um, outside Boston. They get a lot of whales come uh, migrating through uh, the, the the waters there, so they use uh, AIS. Uh, atons to uh, show the ships where they can, uh, where they should sail. So they're effectively having a traffic separation zone that moves depending upon the the uh, the whales that are migrating through that area any time. So another interesting use of of AIS technology. Um, so what else have we got there? Um, we've got uh, search and rescue. Um, so quite often. Um, may see on, on a chart plot screen a fast moving target suddenly appear um, as, uh, as, a, as a search and rescue helicopter has a particular type of transponder in there um, and those are, uh, are more and more being seen in different areas now. Um, you've got the AIS man overboard, AIS SARTs as well. Um, hopefully you won't see uh, any of those but if you do they come up again as a, they use a different set of messages. And all of these 26 messages which are in this table are all transmitted over the, the same VHF channels and the AIS receive or the transponder that receives these messages knows what type of message they are and encodes them and sends them onto the chart. So um, it is important to note that these 26 messages have evolved over time. So for instance, the class A uh, messages, the, the first sort of four or five, they were in there from the from the start um, and pretty much every system um, that supports AIS will show those. But some older equipment won't necessarily show um, ATONs or search and rescue or even AIS man overboard. So just something to be aware of. If you've got older uh, chart plotters, uh, they may not show um, some of these newer um, 
AIS systems. Okay, uh, I won't spend too much on this um, because we could get into too much detail, but basically on NMEA 183, there were two sentences, new sentences uh, created for AIS. There's the AI VDM sentence, which is what your AIS receive or transponder will transmit to your chart plotter whenever it receives a, an AIS transmission from another vessel. And then uh, there's the AI VDO, which is your own vessel's data. Now this is transmitted only or only created by a transponder. And so the transponder sends that data about itself out in that AI VDO sentence. And the idea here was that it could be used to double check against the GPS data that was coming in for that vessel. Um, so an ECTIS, ECTIS uh, on board a commercial ship would be getting maybe two or three different GPS data from different GPS sources on board. And it could compare those to the VDO sentence to make sure that the GPS of the transponder was giving the same positions. Uh, and that was the idea behind the VDO sentence. As you can see, the, the actual sentences shown here, they all start with this exclamation mark. Now, normally, um, those of you who've looked at LMA 183 before, LMA 183 sentences mostly started with, certainly um, all the initial uh, sentences started with a, a dollar sign, which means that the following data is all ASCII. Um, if you see a, a, a sentence that starts with an exclamation mark like this, um, like the AIS ones, that means that there is binary data in the sentence. So this, as you can see here, you've got um, the AI VDM, comma one, comma one, still in ASCII, then you've got a couple of commas, and then the A, and then it goes into a, a series of, of, of uh, weird and wonderful characters, and that is the binary um, data. So that's the actual AIS message in a binary form. Um, so you can't really read it. Um, it's in a special, it's, it's not even in an 8-bit binary, it's in a special 6-bit binary encoding, which is completely impossible for uh, humans to read. Um, so you have to feed that data into a, a program that knows how to decode it before it makes any sense. But that's what the NMEA 183 sentences for AIS look like. <laughs> in fact, I've gone through all of that um, here. A little bit more information here. You've got the, um, so the first uh, field after the VDM tells you the total number of sentences because um, because the um, some of the data in the AIS messages is quite long, like the static data, for instance, can take up uh, two or three sentences. Um, and so they what they do is they uh, have part of the packet in the first sentence and they have a second sentence with the rest of the data in. So this tells you how many VDM sentences are in this group. Uh, it tells you the what this, so the first sentence would have, if it would say three VDM sentences in this group to make up the whole message. The first field would be three, second one would be one for the first one, two for the second, three for the third. Um, that's what these uh, sentence numbers are. Uh, AIS channel, whether it's being received on channel A or B, and then you've got this encapsulated uh, uh, binary message. Okay, probably too much detail for you there, but let's <laughs> move on. And uh, like I said, it's, it, the binary bit of that message is totally unreadable, but we've got a, a little free um, Windows program called the NMA Display Program, which is on our website, which you can download, which actually, if you fed that, if you linked up the computer to uh, uh, the NMA 183 output from, a, uh, from the transponder or receiver, it would actually show you the different messages and you can get the data there decoded for you. For those that want to dig a bit deeper. Okay, so uh, like I said, when AIS first came out, there was only NMEA 183 um, uh, method of, of communication. Uh, later on, AIS transponder started to uh, support NMEA 2000, and of course, the NMEA organization had to define a series of, of PGNs for the NMEA 2000 spec, which they've done. And they've taken a slightly different approach with 2000 as they did with 183. So with 183, you just had the two message types with uh, to, and the, you know, and in fact, it was really the VDM sentence had uh, had to um, each, although there's just the one VDM sentence, it could have any of those 26 messages types in there. 
Um, so what they did with NMA 2000 is they actually created a different PGN for each message type. So you've actually got 26 PGNs to match the 26 um, message types, which is probably uh, a more intelligent way to do it. Um, so that's, they don't have uh, like the own, like they had, like in 183 where you had the BDO to show your own data. What they do have is a, is a field in each of the PGNs that says whether it's boat's own data or not. So that's again, a slightly different way of handling things. Okay, so although the actual AIS data is always the same, um, it can be displayed in, in a lot of different systems. Um, and over the, the years now, we've seen it being displayed on PCs, on Macs, on chart plotters, on color class A uh, screens, um, on iPads. And now also we've been starting to see uh, VHF radios coming through with uh, with the AIS display built into them, which is a is a is an intelligent move because you know, very often you want to um, be able to see a vessel that's uh, going to potentially be a danger to you, and then the first thing you want to do is call them up on the VHF. So having the integration of the VHF and the AIS is is a very good move. Okay, so let's so. I've got this screen which sort of aims to show you what um, <laughs> a chart plotter looks like with the AS targets. What I'll do, I've actually got, I just need to switch screens now. Um, now I should be able to uh, give you a view of a smarter track which I've got running here. Let's share that. Hopefully, you can all see that. It should be coming through now. Okay, so this is a live feed from from uh, from Portsmouth, um, and this gives you more of an interactive uh, view of, of of AIS and what it looks like on a. I mean, in this case, it's it's a PC program, but uh, you know, the, even the chart plotters now from Garmin, Rain Marine, Navico, they're all starting to have. Uh, AIS implementations, which are nearly as, as good as this uh, PC implementation. So let's have a look at some of the the uh, features here. So you can see now these these uh, vessels here just updating their position every few seconds. So they'll be Class A vessels. Um, they're color coded. So if I go to AIS and key to colors. You'll see that this particular program, there's no standard for how um, uh, ships, sh AIS targets should be color coded. But uh, so every um, system is slightly different in the way they decide to implement the uh, AIS display. But this particular uh, PC program does a, a good job. It color codes based, as you can see here, on the different types of, of vessels. Um, so this one here. Victoria of White is underway. It's doing 8.9 knots. Uh, we can click on it and get more information. You can see it's uh, it's got um, speed and course over ground, and also the heading, that true heading that I mentioned. Um, that's uh, also uh, they must have a, a gyro compass or something on board that's giving them the true heading. Um, destination we've got here. It looks like it's come up from Plymouth. Uh, GDFBU, not quite sure what that is, but I'm sure there's a destination and it's going to be there in 13 days and uh, days and months. That's a long old time. Anyway, <laughs> I've probably not picked a particularly good one there, um, but that gives you some idea of the sort of information that's, that's included. Um, you can see in this particular display, We've got a dotted line to show the course over ground, and we've got a solid line to show the true heading. Um, and this is quite a good way of, of showing it because it shows that any uh, maybe tidal drift would be the main issue here is why the, the heading is slightly different to the course over ground. Um, and also this particular presentation, let's find a vessel that's changing course. Let's see if we've got, here we go. So here, this just puts a little tick on the end and I know some of the chart plot manufacturers now start to do this. I think Rain Marine have done quite a good job on, on theirs. Um, and that just shows you that this vessel is, is starting to turn. Uh, there it's now straightened up again. 
Um, but as it starts to go around into Southampton Water, you'll see a little tick on the end of the line to show that it's changing course. This one here is the Olympian Highway, just changing course slightly. Um, the Atons I mentioned, um, we've got, uh, here we go, we've got Bramble Pile. There's a there's a uh, Aton there um, at the moment, um, and it just tells you, so it just highlights to, on the chart plotter um, that that's a, a bit like the old um, Raycons um, used to do. They used to just, for, for, for very important Atons, um, it just gives them extra importance um, and uh, highlights them on the chart plotting screen. So that's typical what we got there. Now, if we were sailing in this area, um, most systems now also do alarms if, if a vessel's going to come too close to you. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, now. And we'll go switch back to the, the display. There's no, um, fortunately, there's no search and rescue. I was hoping there'd be a search and rescue uh, uh, helicopter or something out today, but there uh, doesn't seem to be any. So just a show, but that gives you a good idea of, of what the AAS targets look like on a on a chart plotter system. Okay, I'm just going to switch back to our screen. Uh, right, there we go. Right. World to come through. Oh, hang on, screen sharing is paused. So let's, let's just not put that there. Uh, okay, yep, yeah, it's back. Sorry, I just hit the pause button there for some reason. Okay, so um, some of the things we we saw there with the targets. I mean, obviously, collision avoidance is is a, is a key one, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the um, how the uh, chart plotter decides whether a target is dangerous or not um, but collision avoidance is one of the key was one of the primary drivers for um, for uh, development of AIS um, and this is how the chart plotter the cap type of calculation that the chart plotters and, and uh, electronic charting systems are doing so basically you can set a guard zone effectively around your boat so you can say right I want to know if a uh, vessel is going to come within one nautical mile of me and from that point on, once you've set that alarm, your chart plotter um, is going to be drawing an imaginary guard zone around you, uh, one nautical mile. Um, and it's also going to be looking at all the AIS targets and it's going to be trying to project based on their course and their speed and their current position. When that vessel, if that vessel is going to come within one nautical mile of you based on that current course, um, if it does, and uh, it thinks it's going to come within that, it will tell you um, a particular time of when that's going to happen. So it's going to tell you close, it's going to come to uh, within 0.191 nautical miles, and it's going to happen in about three and a half minutes based on the current speed. So that's the time to the closest point of approach of TCPA, and that's the closest point of approach, um, which is a distance CPA. So you'll, you'll hear people talk about CPA and TCP a alarms, and that's what they are, closest point of approach and the time to closest point of approach. So that's that. Uh, other things that you can use AIS for, obviously, uh, identifying vessels. You can um, quickly see, um, as I did before, we can click on a particular target and bring up all the information about it, so you know whether it's a, a yacht or a super tanker, you can know what speed and course it's doing straight away. So whereas with you could do that again with radar, you had to be pretty skilled and be used to using radar on a regular basis to be able to work out that sort of information from um, you know, the sort of screen that you see on a radar screen. Um, you know, most um, pleasure boats don't have the facility of, of ARPA of being able to automatically track uh, radar targets. So radar on a, on a, on a pleasure boat, yes, it it, it can give you uh, information about um, uh, you know, the positions of other vessels, but you have to be very uh, experienced and used to using it to, to be able to reliably do that. And in stressful situations, um, you know, AIS and being able to just quickly look at the screen and see exactly what vessels are there, 
what they're doing um, is, is really uh, a real lifesaver. Um, the other thing that AIS can be used for is by emergency services. So obviously if, if a vessel's in trouble but it, and it's got AIS um, on board and it's still operating, then they can immediately know, you know within a few meters of where it is, whereas they're not reliant upon um, visual uh, reports of, of positions and estimating positions. So that, that's a, a really uh, useful facility. Um, the other good thing with AIS is it can see round corners, and this, this screen is supposed to represent the um, type of image that you'd see on a radar of this headland. So the radar bounces off the headland, so you just see this edge of the headland. You don't see um, because it's hidden effectively to the radar uh, reflection of this boat that's just coming up around the headland. Whereas with AIS, you'd actually get that boat's position. Okay, so class B for small craft. We, we spoke about the different classes of, of AIS. Um, now, when AIS first uh, came out, you know, the class A uh, transponders were incredibly expensive, thousands of pounds only ever fitted on, on large uh, commercial vessels that, had, that were basically mandated to fit them. So they grudgingly fitted the, uh, the transponder um, and are very expensive. And, but, Companies like uh, NASA um, produced AIS receivers quite cheaply, and so you know the most pleasure boats' first experience of AIS was was an AIS receiver. But now, with only like three hundred pound price difference between a, trans, a Class B transponder and a receiver, we're seeing transponder sales uh, equaling, if not you know, exceeding, um, receiver sales in our, in our catalog. So um, you know it's 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 very easy to, to uh, upsell a, a customer from a receiver to a transponder because the price difference is not that great, but the benefits of being able to, of knowing that they uh, their vessel is being seen is, is, is really is really good. Um, the only problem with AIS is that it's been almost a bit of a, um, uh, uh, it, its own success has, has also been um, a problem for it because you know, now, typically, on a maybe not at the moment because of uh, COVID, but on a normal uh, weekend out in the Solent, you can see so many Class B um, uh, positions uh, you know, being reported. There are so many vessels out there uh, that can become quite clustered on a, on a chart across the screen. And you know, around the island race, it becomes completely my <laughs> nightmare. You see, you know, thousands of of, of, of AIS equipped craft so I think for the industry we do need to try and encourage customers to uh, fit the silent switch I mean most class B transponders have the option of a silent uh, switch being used and um, use that and, and, and use it diligently use it you know when if, if it's sunny if, if visibility is good then turn off your class B transponders uh, transmitting still receive so, so when when the silence when it's in silent mode um, you're still receiving, so you still get the benefit of, of, of those CPA, TCPA alarms if you've enabled them going off if there's any large vessels approaching you. But you know, unless the weather starts to deteriorate, starts getting you know, dusk, or you're going to be crossing a shipping lane, those are the times when you would turn off the silent button and go back to normal transmission. And that, I think that will become sort of the, the etiquette, or it needs to become the etiquette that uh, within small craft. Um, of when to use uh, Class B transmissions. Okay, so Class A, I, I mentioned they were thousands of pounds when they first came out. Um, now um, the the prices have come down. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but it's you know, less than two thousand pounds now for for a Class A, and that for a lot of uh, pleasure boat owners, where they've got larger vessels sailing you know, blue water uh, yachtsmen um, or um, big because the Class A um, vessels uh, have a faster update rate, if you've got a, a large Princess Sunseeker powerboat regularly doing over 25 knots, then you can travel an awful long distance in 30 seconds, which is the normal Class B uh, transmission update rate. So, you know, fast, faster update rate offered by Class A is, is really uh, 
useful on, on those types of vessels. And you know, for 1750 pounds or whatever the price is, in class A now, you can, um, it's a lot of benefit for that type of customer. And also they have, you know, the, the Class A's now have very nice colour built-in displays option sometimes of using them with electronic charts. So, you know, you've also got the benefit of a, of a backup chart plotter. Um, so if you can't quite stretch to a Class A, then and then the other option is um, Class B+, plus, which until recently wasn't an option, um, but in the last couple of years, um, Digital Yacht and other companies have, have started to sell um, Class B plus transponders. Um, you've got five watt transmit power, so slightly higher than two watts of, of normal Class B, so you get a better, slightly better range. Um, you've got faster update rate uh, for faster boats. Uh, boats that are over 14 and a half knots get uh, like 15 seconds update rate, and then if you're going over 24 knots, I think it is regularly then you're getting the benefit of a five second update rate so uh, and you get the guaranteed time slot so if you're in a busy area like Solent, um, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, um, you know, any of these areas where you get a lot of, of, of AS equipped vessels then guaranteed time slot is also important. Now I've spoken a little, quite a bit about the, the different uh, benefits of, or the different features of the different classes so I won't go spend too much time on this table but again you've got there one simple table that tells you the differences between class a class b plus and class b okay just uh, quickly um just keep one eye on the time i think we're not doing too badly um so when ais receivers first came out um they were generally single channel um, so what that means is they have one rf receiver which can only listen to one frequency at a time. So what tends to happen is for 30 seconds, it will be listening on channel one, and then after that 30 seconds, it will switch and it will listen on channel two. Uh, problem is, is while it's listening on one channel, it misses any AS targets coming on the other channel. So you effectively end up having, you know, it's twice the, the um, generally takes twice as long to, to pick up the target, and then you're only getting the update twice longer than um, so instead of say like class b um target being picked up every 30 seconds it might be every minute or even a minute and a half if it misses it it just happens to to miss it twice on the same channel so those early single channel as receivers are really these days are, are, you know with the amount of as traffic that are out there they they should really the, the owners of those should really be thinking about gradually updating those um because they could be missing you know, half the traffic that's out there. Um, all of our uh, digital yacht um, AIS receivers are dual channel and all our transponders as well, they're obviously dual channel as well. So um, you get maximum number of targets, you never miss a target um, because you've got two RF receivers that are listening to the two channels all the time uh, and never miss a beat. Okay, other question that we get asked quite a lot by customers, splitter versus dedicated antenna. So this is for transponders. Um, primarily um, so you know we get a mix of customers with yachts and with power boats um, and what tends to happen is with the, the yachts when they um, uh, you know look at the um, the AS transponder they realize they've got to have a VHF antenna um, some of them will uh, think about maybe putting a second dedicated antenna down at deck level um, because what you can't do is have two VHF antennas within close proximity of each other, because what happens is all the power from this antenna goes straight out into this antenna, uh, potentially damaging the receiver circuitry that's in there. So you can't have two um, antennas, say, at the top of a yacht's mast, one for AS and one for the standard VHF. So what's um, has been developed over the years is, is an antenna splitter, which allows you to have one antenna, i.e. the main antenna, VHF antenna at the top of the mast, use that for both AIS and VHF. Now, the pros of that is that you've got, you're have got using the best antenna, the maximum, you know, get the maximum range because it's the antenna that's at the top of the mast. Um, and you know, that, 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 there's no doubt that you'll get the best performance with that antenna than you would that antenna at deck level. 
Um, if it's a uh, twin mast, then great. <laughs> and there I probably would go for a dedicated antenna on the second mast, but uh, you know, not all of our, uh, most of our customers would be single masts. So uh, the splitter does have the benefit of pretty easy installation, really. Um, so installation costs um, will be um, lower for the customer for this. Um, but, uh, and you get also now with the, um, in the past with splitters, you used to get a degradation of the uh, received signal on the VHF because you've got you know, one antenna, signal comes down, gets split to the two devices, one to the AS. So you get half the signal going this side, half the signal to the VHF. So you get 3 dB loss on the, on the uh, signal. Um, with the latest generation of splitters out, we do a, these zero loss splitters now where it amplifies the signal before it splits it and basically you end up with no loss. So there's there's no, you know, the old problems of splitters is no longer there. Um, so the, really the only con these days of a, of a splitter for an AIS is the cost compared to the dedicated antenna cost. But then quite often if you take the installation cost of a dedicated antenna versus the installation of a splitter, not much difference in that. Um, and the only other con of, of using a splitter is that while you're doing any VHF radio transmissions, then you're not getting AS targets. But most customers these days, the amount of VHF um, voice work that they do on, on their VHF is, is less than they used to. Um, so that tends to not be such an issue. Um, on the uh, dedicated antennas, I mean, obviously it's lower costs. 40, 50 pounds for an antenna compared to maybe 200 pounds for a, a splitter. Um, you do have the benefit of, if you haven't already got an emergency VHF antenna, you can use then that if you're, if you're smart where you locate the, um, the, uh, the radio and the, and the AS, you can just make it so that they can quickly unplug the AS antenna and use that as a backup for the VHF antenna. Um, the cons are another antenna. <laughs> Uh, installation can be time consuming and, and also that you know having it at deck level you will see significantly less range um, maybe half the range that you'd see uh, from the VHF antenna at the top of the mast. Okay a um, bit more about splitters there um, I mean with class B splitters um, there are sp specific splitters for class B's I mean when you can also get lower cost splitters, maybe 50, 60 pounds from people like Band 10, um, Electronics Dip 1, um, and uh, those those splitters are for receiver only, so, and they're quite often used with FM radio to allow you to use the VHF aerial with an FM radio. Those type of lower cost splitters are not suitable for use with a Class B transponder. You have to, unfortunately, use the more expensive um, intelligence splitter that has two very fast switching um, channels inside because the AIS transmission is only 26 thousandths of a second long so you know, you've got to have a, a splitter that's capable of quickly detecting seeing that the AIS is going to transmit switches removes the VHF from the from the antenna uh, lets the AIS make its transmission and then switches back it has to be done very quickly and that's the reason for the cost unfortunately um, Got a few diagrams there showing typical um, installations. Uh, I won't uh, spend too much time on that. Like I say, you can download this presentation if you want all of these slides later. A um, little bit about AIS man overboards and SARTs. Um, so the recently been um, approved by um, the IMO for GMDSS use. Um, so a SART is typically found um, life raft or uh, hydroscopic release on, on board the vessel and then you've got the little personal man overboard um, devices which can be worn on the life vest and as soon as the life vest inflates it uh, triggers the uh, AIS man overboard device to, to start working um, and these will transmit your, they've got GPS inside I mean it's basically it's, it's, it's almost like a class B transponder in a battery powered um, waterproof uh, device so as soon as they're activated they start getting a GPS position fix they start transmitting your position if you're the unfortunate man overboard or you're in a life raft 
they start transmitting your position um, over the AIS network. Um, it's only transmitting one watt, so it's 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 very much for it's under the these these devices are uh, intended so that the best people to pick you up are the people whose boat you've fallen off. <laughs> so basically, they're trying to signal your position to the boats in the very local vicinity. So, and that you know, in a lot of cases, it'll be people on board your that are still on board your boat will get the alarm, and they'll be the ones that will see your position on the chart plotter will come back around and hopefully pick you up very quickly. Um, that's the idea behind these. And they work really well. I mean, most modern uh, chart plotters now um, uh, support them and they display your uh, the position as a unique symbol on the on the chart and will trigger a, an alarm on the chart plotter, um, alerting to everyone on board that a man overboard situation has occurred. Um, and unlike EPIRBs and, and, and uh, and the sort of uh, lifeguard, ran over lifeguard type, you know, Bluetooth type thing where you, you, you fall in the water and it just triggers an alarm. These do that and they also give you continuous updates of your of the position of the man overboard on the chart plotting system, which is, is really good. So regardless of the wind and the tide and how far the man overboard drifts, you've got constant display on your chart plotter of where that person is. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end now. I, I recognise this slide. So, um, a little bit about um, the AIS services that are online. So, things like marine traffic, uh, vessel finder, uh, quite a few systems now. Um, and these, a lot of customers now are using these to check their own AIS positions, obviously, uh, looking at where they've been, you know, their loved ones and family might use them to check on, uh, on where they are um, and they're great systems um, the data that's collected is relies upon a series of AIS receivers being fitted um, in shoreside houses or businesses um, in many cases is just volunteer uh, people that are interested in AIS or companies that are interested or have a, a marine interest and They'll buy an AIS receiver, they'll connect it up to their, their internet, their uh, router at home or in the office, and then um, they'll start to receive AIS data locally, and that will all be fed back to a, a main. In fact, let's just go back. There we go. This is, this is typically what you have. So you have a series of AIS receiver base stations. They all feed in through uh, the whoever's um, operating it will have a, a router connected to the internet it will feed that data through to marine traffic web servers which collect all of the data and combine it all together and then they feed that out um, over the internet to uh, web browsers so when you open your let's go back so when you open your web browser it will have all of this live AIS data there is a bit of a, um, a lag from from when they receive it to when it gets fed through to here so it's not it's not quite as real time as as, um, as as it is on a on a when you're using an AIS on board a vessel, but it's pretty good. Um, there are um, issues though with holes in the coverage. So, for instance, here the good thing I, I like about marine traffic is that they are one of the few services where they actually let you see where their stations are, where their receiving stations are. So, if you go to their layer uh, menu. You can actually turn on the stations and that's all these little green and red um, antenna type um, icons here and so you can immediately see where you know if, if i was out here in the solar I'd, I'd immediately see my nearest receiving station it's green which means it's operating fully um, and feeding data back so chances are that anywhere here i'll be fine as i start to come up this end i notice the cow shot one's offline at the moment it's red um, and also the cows one is also red. So here maybe there's there'll be a little bit of a, uh, a black spot. Um, and obviously this is Solon, where it's you know really popular, busy area. Um, you start going you know up the east coast, uh, down to the southwest. There are areas where there are not regular AIS receivers in these networks. So you know I quite often get customers ring me up and say I've just fitted this new transponder of yours, and I looked on marine traffic can't see me okay well then let's have a look where are you okay you're 
up on uh, Cromer um, and uh, where's your nearest uh, AIS receiving station on marine traffic? Oh, well, that's around at King's Inn. So, OK, so that's the reason because you're too far away. You've got to, if you're a class B transponder, you've got to really be within eight miles of one of these um, receiving stations to be picked up. And that's what a lot of customers don't realize. They say, oh, it's on the Internet. I can see all these other vessels around me. Chances are those are probably class A transponder um, units which have a wider range. So they start to worry. So just be aware, you know, marine traffic and other AS online services are great, but they do have holes in their coverage. And also, you know, they might have a receiving station there, but it might be offline for whatever reason. Uh, because like I say, a lot of these are volunteers. They're just people like you and I that happen to have a house or a business near the sea. Um, but they might have a problem with their internet connection. They might have gone on holiday. <laughs> There's all sorts of reasons why they might not be sending data back to these services. Um, I think we've reached the end of the, of the slide. Um, so just in summary, AS really invaluable system. Um, there's no reason really why um, with the prices now of, of the equipment that you know, all small vessels can have a, uh, at least a, a receiver on board to, to see where the big ships are. Um, but it is important that um, you know, it's a simple and automatic system in most cases, but it is important that we understand the underlying technologies and the, the problems that can happen um, so we can talk to, to customers knowledgeably about these these things and also you know, find things to, to upgrade older systems, uh, be aware of, of old chart plotters that may not support some of the new AIS systems. So I hope you're, you've enjoyed it's been worth you spending an hour with me today and um, learning about AIS. I'm going to try and unmute you now. Um, if I suddenly get loads of feedback, <laughs> I might have to ask you to, to come in one at a time. But if anyone's got any questions, let's, let's see. So I'm just going to unmute. Uh, let's try unmute all. Sorry, that's not going quite too bad. Uh, okay, so I think I've unmuted you all, but if if um, I think you then have to um, unmute yourself individually. So if anyone's got a question, um, you should be able to unmute yourself and then ask. Hello? Is there anyone out there? <laughs> Paul, I'm out here, but I can't think of a question. Thank you very much. OK, well, at least, I've, great. <laughs> at least I know now that you've all been receiving me. I You're should have probably, probably have done a, a, a test before <laughs> to make sure. But uh, has it been useful? I'm, I'm hoping that uh, there's been some bits in there that yes, you may not. I... De definitely better than painting the house. Okay. Yes, that's it. Watching paint dry. That's it. I've, I've never been compared to that before, but uh, no, I appreciate the. No, no, painting. Actually, actually painting, which is what I should be doing. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Well, if there's if there's no other questions, thanks again for um for listening in. Um, and I will be posting this. Um, it will go up onto digitalyacht.net. Oh, I see somebody's just asked a question by chat. I see somebody's just asked a question by chat. Okay. Hi, hi Paul. I don't know if you can Thanks. hear me. Uh, just, just one question. Yeah, sure. Can, can you? Yeah, sure. Okay, right. If you program your AIS unit with the static data, Mm -hmm. um, if for whatever reason you unplug the unit or it, it's uh, it's taken off the boat or or whatever, does all that get lost and have to be reprogrammed again, or does it does it maintain no. it? No, it's always in non-volatile memory. So, um, and I think in most cases it's all flash memory. I've never heard of. Um, I mean, you you do get some equipment um, which like GPS receivers where they have an internal battery for backing up that sort of data, but I think. AIS was at a time when non-volatile memory, flash memory was was um, available and fairly low cost. So 
Yeah, you know, all the transponders I've ever heard of. I've never heard of. All the transponders I've never heard of. Perfect. Okay. Many thanks. Very, right. very enjoyable. Very interesting. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Thanks.